Uh, welcome to a CLE program put on Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Uh, we put these programs on for our, for, for our alumni at a, at a very reasonable price. I think you'll all agree. And we hope that you get something out of it. And if you have any ideas for CLE programs, you know, please let me know or others know uh, because we like, we enjoy putting these on. I'm Steve Petrus. I am the director of the Cox International Law Center at Case Law School and also the U.S. National Director of the Canada-U.S. Law Institute. And I'm also an adjunct professor at Case Law School. Uh, that's not what I did in, in my career. I retired from Baker and Hostetler at the end of 2018 where I practiced in the business practice group. I was the head of our international transactional practice group at Baker. Uh, but since, uh, for many years, actually since I was in law school, I graduated from Case in 1979. In 76, the year I started, Sidney Picker created the Canada-US Law Institute, which is a binational organization uh, led by Case Western Reserve University School of Law and the University of Western Ontario's law faculty. And that started in 1976, so I, I can honestly say I've been with it since its start, because I remember my first week at law school, uh, Professor Pickard talking to me about how he wants to create this institute. Uh, it's been going strong, and for you who are interested, we have our annual conference, April 16 and 17 of this year, with the dinner Thursday night the 16th at the law school. The speaker will be Admiral James Loy, former Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, former uh, Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, and always a big interest in the Arctic. And the theme this year is the Arctic, the management and issues concerning the Arctic. And we'll cover the next day program will be at the Botanical Gardens, and it'll cover all aspects of the Arctic. You know, what do we do about national security? What do we do about defense? What do we do about resource exploration, ownership? all of those issues, and it's a star-studded group that will put on that conference. Uh, but today, we're here to talk about the laws of the Great Lakes. So I was asked, uh, I think it was probably last July, I was told that uh, I had to put on a CLE program. What's my topic going to be? And I thought, oh, how about laws of the Great Lakes? You know, that sounds great. So. That's what it is, and what we did is uh, the students at the Canada-U.S. Law Journal got involved in a research project which essentially said, go out and find the federal, state, provincial laws that concern the Great Lakes. And so that's what we did. And here is a listing of the students involved in the project. Carla Gill was the coordinator, and then we have a group of 10 students, first year, second year, LLM students, who were participating in this research, which was a very comprehensive, long drawn out battle where, where we combed through all the laws of the states and the federal governments involved in the Great Lakes. And we're gonna hear from two of the students about, about this project as we go through the presentation. And then we're going to talk about what we want to what we want to do with it. It's interesting because we would have figured, you know, we'll just find these laws. That shouldn't be too hard. It's actually it's very hard to find the laws that govern the Great Lakes. So let's move on. Let's talk about we're normally uh, when we think about countries or nations, we think about how they're they're normally organized along political ground. Uh, political grounds geographically based on land, okay? There are very few instances in the development of civilization where a, a political entity or nation was organized around a body of water. So I tried to think, where, what are examples of this? You know, where a nation was organized around a body of water, and you could think of Egypt and the Nile, and maybe, maybe that works to some extent, although you know, the Nile's longer than Egypt is. 
Uh, or, or you could actually think of one that's very interesting, the Republic of the Gambia. This is a very interesting country on the western side of Africa because it's totally surrounded by Senegal and it exists on both sides of the Gambia River. It's very interesting that there is a country in the world that was organized and created around a body of water. It has somewhat of a checkered past. Um, and, it, and it's peculiar that it exists the way it does. But there is one country like that out there. Uh, it's, it's interesting, by the way, because the name of the country is The Gambia. There's actually a convention on naming of countries, and the preposition the is the, is the official part of that name. There's one other country in the world where the preposition the is also part of the official name. Who knows what that country is? The, the Ohio State University. <laughs> there you go. No, not the Vatican. No, I thought the Netherlands, but no, it's, it's not actually the Netherlands. It's the Bahamas. So I don't know why, but it is. Um, so here we're talking about the Great Lakes as a body of water, okay? Um, and here's a satellite picture of the Great Lakes with Lake Superior. Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, down to Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Now, there's a little lake in between um, Huron and Lake Erie called Lake St. Clair. It's not technically considered one of the five great lakes, but it's also there. So let's talk a little bit about the Great Lakes, because this is a significant, important body of water in the world. It, the Great Lakes region consists of five Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway. There are two nations, Canada and the United States. There are two provinces, Ontario and Quebec, and then eight states, right? Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. And there are also First Nations and Indian tribes, as well as numerous cities, counties, and regional governmental authorities that all have an interest and uh, want to talk about and discuss and regulate and control the Great Lakes. So here is uh, not a satellite picture, but more of a political picture of the Great Lakes that shows the, the eight states, the, the two countries, the two Canadian provinces. Um, and it also shows the boundary line, the, the international boundary line that goes right through the Great Lakes. So you'll notice that it basically uh, splits Superior, Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. Uh, the interesting fact is Lake Michigan is the only one of the Great Lakes that's 100% within the boundaries of the United States. Right? And this, you can see then the states, all the states that border the Great Lakes. So let's talk about the economy of the Great Lakes. And here are some interesting statistics about the economy of the Great Lakes. Um, if you took the two provinces and the eight Great Lakes states and you combined their economies, how large do you think they would be in terms of the economies of the world? What number would they be if you took them all and you combined them? What do you think? Any guesses out there? And no, they actually be the third largest economy in the world, be behind the United States and China. Then it would be the, the Great Lakes. Now, that's a little bit unfair because it includes all of New York, which includes New York City. So, you know, is New York City a, a city on the Great Lakes? Not really. But anyway, it would include Chicago, Cleveland, Toronto, all you know, Ontario, Quebec. So. But there are some other very interesting statistics about the economic size and power of this region, which, if you think about it, you would say, well, it might make sense to make this region, you know, its own nation, you know, because there, there are so many shared interests uh, across the Great Lakes. By the way, I'm, I'm not advocating that, but um, I am involved in a group. It's called the Council of the Great Lakes Region. It's a, it's a binational council <clears throat> that's dedicated to the economic development, sustainability of the Great Lakes, 
and I'm actually chairman of the board, and the Canada U.S. Law Institute was one of the founding members of this council, which uh, was conceptualized actually by a report from the Brookings Institute in 2012, and then we formed this in 2013 and 14 and had our inaugural meeting in 2014 at the annual conference of the Canada uh, United States Law Institute. Um, and it's very active now, and it's getting into all kinds of issues in terms of the economic development of the Great Lakes, and particularly the sustainability and the protection. Uh, so they're all, as you can imagine, there are all types of issues involved. There's navigation, there's environment, there's you know protecting the Great Lakes uh, as a natural resource. What's very interesting, I want to point out in the middle, there's a big drop of water. <clears throat> and it says less than 1% of the Great Lakes is renewable. So if you had the bright idea that we should use the water of the Great Lakes and sell it, you know, maybe sell it to Saudi Arabia, as, as people have tried to do, or pipe it down to Arizona and create fertile lands out of deserts, um, <clears throat> you have to be very careful because only 1% is renew renewable. Now, 1% of the Great Lakes is a huge amount of water huge amount of water. But <clears throat> there are environmental disaster examples of overusing the water of a lake. How many of you have heard of the Aral Sea, which is in Russia and Kazakhstan and all that? One of the worst environmental disasters ever, because what happened is uh, there was an effort to develop that area. They decided to grow a lot of cotton. Cotton takes a lot of water. They took the water out of the Aral Sea and irrigated the cotton fields. Well, what happened is the, um, the evaporation <clears throat> and use of the water into the Aral Sea exceeded the recharge rate, and the sea actually has dried up. So what used to be actually a very productive sea with a lot of fishing, et cetera, is I think I forget what it is, but it's maybe a quarter of its size, its original size, and it's all dried up, and it's created, you know, salt beds and all kinds of environmental problems. So we have to be very careful. We're going to talk about that a little bit, about the Great Lakes and and these issues about water usage and diversion. <clears throat> so if you look at at the uh, size of the trade between U.S. and Canada on the Great Lakes, it's two hundred thirty-two billion dollars. 20 of the top 100 universities in the world are here in this Great Lakes region. Uh, the Great Lakes supplies water to 40 million people. You know, there are 46 million jobs within this region. Uh, and you can read the other statistics. So uh, let's talk a little bit about each of the Great Lakes just to hear what we are talking about. So Lake Superior is the largest of the Great Lakes. In fact, you could fit all the other Great Lakes um, inside Lake Superior, plus three more the size of Lake Erie. That's how big Lake Superior is. And the reason it's, it's that big is it's so deep compared to the other lakes. Um, it contains 10% of the world's <coughs> fresh surface water. Now. Um, the Great Lakes is, 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 uh, contains 21% of the world's surface fresh water. But who knows what's the biggest lake in the world? Who knows what lake that is? That actually contains 22% of the world's fresh water. Does anybody know the biggest lake in the world? It, it's, no, it's not the Caspian Sea. You, you're close. You're getting in the right area. It's actually, that's right. Baikal Lake, uh, which is in Russia, north of Mongolia. It is the big, in fact, it, it is very big. You could fit all the Great Lakes plus uh, five more Lake Eries into Baikal Lake. So that's how big that one is. Um, lake Superior uh, is an interesting lake because I've heard, I've heard it said two ways. If you take a drop of water, 
at the start of Lake Superior. It'll take 105 years for that drop to exit the lake. Uh, according to other statistics, it takes almost two centuries for the lake to replenish itself with its water. Now, the next lake is Lake Huron. It's the second largest among the Great Lakes and the fifth largest in the world. But, uh, but hydrogeologically, you know, but for the Straits of Mackinac, Lake Michigan and Huron would probably be considered one lake. But for our purposes, it's two lakes. Interesting here, it takes 22 years for a drop, I mean, for the lake water to replenish itself. A drop of water is another measurement. And I, I don't know how long it takes one drop from the top of Lake Huron to get to the bottom. I, I have a question. Yeah. Is lake uh, Michigan and Lake Huron at the same level? Yes, same yes, level? hydrogeologically, yes. Uh, lake Erie is the fourth largest great lake in surface area, and it's the 11th largest lake on the planet. It's the smallest uh, in terms of its depth. The average depth of Lake Erie is about 50 feet, okay? Some, and I think the deepest part of Lake Erie is around, if I remember correctly, there might be a spot that actually goes to 250 feet, but I think it, I think it more sits like 150 feet. Um, the water in Lake Erie replaces itself every 2.6 years. So that's pretty fast. Lake Erie flushes itself out. That's why, uh, from a pollution perspective, the lake cleaned itself up relatively quickly. According to that other test, how much does it take from a, uh, a drop of water at the, at the western edge of Lake Erie to get, uh, you know, exited out into the Niagara River? Um, it's 18 months. It's a fast, fast moving lake in, that, in those terms. Lake Ontario is the smallest of the Great Lakes in surface area and the second smallest in depth. It's the 14th largest on the planet. An interesting statistic is Babe Ruth hit his first major league home run in Toronto and it went into Lake Ontario. So that's what made Lake Ontario famous was Babe Ruth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so now let's look at uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway because that's what connects the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean and the world. And in, when we talk about, we'll talk about uh, the need for a treaty in terms of navigation. Um, we include the whole, what we call the maritime transportation system, which would include all the five Great Lakes uh, plus the St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence Seaway. Interesting, you know, when, when you get to Montreal, the St. Lawrence Seaway is all within Canada, okay? But we still talk about um, the Great Lakes transportation system as including the St. Lawrence Seaway. So what types of laws are there that govern the Great Lakes? Well, they're all t what we found there are treaties, compacts, there are agreements, memorandums of understanding, executive orders, federal statutes, state and provincial statutes, and municipal ordinances. And I, I didn't include that, but there are also uh, county ordinances or regulations or whatever you want to you want to call them. Uh, and we, we'll talk about some of these, but let's let's talk about a some of these different types of laws and how they work. So we have treaties, you know, between Canada and the United States. And a treaty is an agreement between two countries that is ratified by the Congress of the United States, right? Um, the major seminal treaty between Canada and the United States that governs the Great Lakes is what is called the treaty between the United States and Great Britain relating to boundary water, waters and questions arising between the United States and Canada, which was entered into in 1909. It's referred to as the Boundary Waters Treaty. Okay? It's the treaty that created what's called the International Joint Commission. It's, a very, uh, it, it's actually a very successful treaty. There are three commissioners uh, that are Canadian and three the, that are from the U.S. There's a U.S. chairman, there's a Canadian chairman. 
And essentially, the purpose of this commission, uh, which started out really as a method to resolve disputes so that Canada and the United States would peacefully use the Great Lakes and each would have access to them. If you go back and read the, the treaty, the first article, I, I find it very interesting because it, it has within it a very important legal point governing the Great Lakes. And it says, the navigation of all navigable boundary waters which includes the Great Lakes, and it actually was a concern about Lake Michigan that Canada had, which led to this treaty, um, shall forever continue free and open for purposes of commerce to the inhabitants and to the ships, vessels, and boats of both countries equally, subject, however, to laws and regulations of either country. So this, this is the treaty that says U.S. ships can go in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes and Canadian ships can go into U.S. waters of the Great Lakes. It gives us that right. That's why it's one of the seminal treaties, and we're going to talk more about it as we go on. Uh, there are less formal treaties. You know, and I, I put tre treaty in quotes there because there's one that, that arises from an exchange of letters between the uh, Minister of International Affairs and the U.S. Secretary of State, which has been recognized as a treaty. It concerned the development of the locks on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, there are also compacts. Anybody familiar with what a compact is? A compact is, it's different than a treaty. It's an agreement between states, or it's an agreement between states and foreign powers. So it could be agreement between the state of Ohio and the province of Ontario or the state of Ohio and another government, or whatever. But as you, as you might know, the Constitution of the United States doesn't like states entering into agreements with foreign powers. That's something reserved to the federal government. And that, that article says, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, enter into any agreements or compacts with another state. Uh, let's see, what did I do? With another with another state or with a foreign power. So you need congressional consent for compacts. And we're going to talk about a, um, a very important compact between the United States and, and between U.S. states and the two Canadian provinces that surround the Great Lakes. Uh, but a con a, the consent of Congress can be done either expressly or impliedly. So it doesn't actually have to be uh, an act of Congress that passes it. Okay, there are also agreements. There are agreements between states and provinces, which, by the way, don't necessarily require congressional consent. And that's because of a, a U.S. Supreme Court case called Virginia versus Tennessee in 1893, which said congressional consent in those cases where it does not involve um, the power of the U.S. government or a political balance within government, those agreements between states and provinces do not need consent. We'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about one of those. There are also memorandums of understanding. Uh, and here's an example. There's a memorandum of understanding between Canada and the United States on the recognition of load lines in terms of shipping. Now, does anybody know what a load line is? In terms of shipping, it's, it's pretty interesting. This is, this is what it is, that picture there. And if you see the circle with the line through it, um, that is what, what is called the Pimsel line, or that's, that's the line where the boat should be loaded. If, if the water is above that line, it's got too much cargo in it. If it's below that line, it's got room to take on more, and it might need, it might need to uh, take on ballast water to balance itself out. But this is, there is a convention on load lines. So here, and this convention now uh, is adopted by Canada and the United States with respect to shipping on the Great Lakes. So can anybody tell me what any of these things mean? I, I, uh, 
I found this to be pretty interesting because in our group of students, we said, what are load lines? Let's try to figure this out. Well, here it is. The, um, the load line right there uh, at, at, at the level, because water has different properties depending on temperature and season and whether it's saline or not saline, um, the line in the middle, this is actually where it would be in summer in, in salt water. The W below the S is winter. The WNA way below is winter North Atlantic. If you go above the line, the T is tropical, and, and the F is fresh water, and the TF is tropical fresh water. So this boat right here, this ship, if, it, if it, the level was where it's at, it would be eight meters. The boat would be eight meters in the water. Now, eight meters is, how many, know, how, how many feet is eight meters? Anybody know? It's 26.25 feet, or 26, uh, 26 feet and three inches. Right? How, how many of you know the depth of the channels in the Great Lakes? What's the depth kept to? And we're going to get into why it's kept at that depth. Anybody know? Um, it's actually 27 feet. So this boat would have trouble because it, it actually should be at the F line for fresh water. And it'd be, it would be too deep for, for the Great Lakes. Uh, so what are the areas of law uh, covered by this research that we found? Well, there, there are some broad areas. I just want to go through them quickly. There's environmental protection. So we saw the laws of the Great Lakes. There's conservation and restoration, ecosystems, fishing, floodplains, fracking, invasive species, ballast water. We'll talk about that. Pollution, sewage, sustainable development, water quality, water organism protection, water storage, water usage, and wildlife protection. There's also infrastructure laws, and these cover things like bridges, coastal management, harbors, hydropower, mining, pipelines, ports, and wind energy. We're going to talk about wind energy. There's seaway management, which is dredging, ice breaking, public usage, security, and tolls on the Great Lakes. And there's the maritime as a major topic, which covers accidents, claims, and disputes boating, uh, whether commercial or recreational, extradition, fisheries, health and medical, law enforcement, pilotage, uh, shipping, salvage, telecommunications, and vessel registration. Talk a little bit about law enforcement. Um, there, as, as we know, you know, halfway across Lake Erie, there's an international boundary. So if you're smuggling something out of Canada into the United States, you know, marijuana is legal in Canada, not legal in the United States, medically here in Ohio and 32 other states, yes. But if you have 150 pounds of marijuana on your boat and you're, you're crossing the border into the United States, um, probably not a good idea, right? Now, if you have 150 pounds of marijuana and you want to get it out of the United States and the Coast Guard's chasing you and you make it to the Canadian waters, are you okay? Are you all set? What if you're escaping for another crime? What happens? How do you, how do you pursue? Do you stop? Do you wave? Do you cross the line? Wave to the US Coast Guard and say, sorry, guys, I'm out of your jurisdiction. Um, interestingly enough, what the, what the Coast Guards of the two countries have agreed to do is that on Coast Guard vessels, there's now law enforcement officer, uh, a US law enforcement officer uh, on Canadian Coast Guard vessels. And there's a Canadian law enforcement officer on US, on, on US Coast Guard vessels. So that you cross the boundary, you still have jurisdiction. It's called, it's called the Ship Rider Program. Uh, so remember that when you guys are es escaping the, you know. When, when was that instituted? Um, it's been several years now. I think it's like maybe four years or five years. Yeah. During prohibition, for example. No, no, it wasn't the case back then. Yeah, back then you get away with it. Um, there's governance and administration that talks about boundaries, defense, and military operations. There are military operations, native peoples, peace, rivers, trade, military operations. Okay, this is one of the surprises to me uh, when discussing military operations, and, and then we announced this program. I had a call from John 
And, and he told me that he is the top JAG officer in Ohio's Navy. So I didn't know Ohio had a Navy. But Ohio has a Navy, John, right? We have a Navy. Yes, and, and John is an officer in Ohio's Navy, which is answerable to the governor, right? He was appointed by the governor. appointed by the governor. So um, I thought that was very interesting. And we have an expert on Ohio naval operations. So that's good. Um, so how did the research go? So I want to talk, uh, I wanted to ask uh, two of our students to talk to us a little bit about the research and get their impressions about, well, how, how easy was it? How hard was it? You know, what was the deal? So first, uh, John Daddario. John is an international LLM student at Case Law School. He's actually Canadian, but he got his law degree from Middlesex uh, University in the United Kingdom. So, and he's been working on this project. John. Good morning, everyone. As Professor Petrus stated, uh, my name is John Daddario, and I'm an international LLM student and one of the senior editors at the Canada US Law Journal, and I am the resident Canadian on our team. Um, when I was first told about this project, I thought it would take about 30 seconds. Um, I thought I would just Google UN Convention on Law of the Sea, and most of this would be taken care of. Uh, to my surprise, the United States is not a party to that treaty, uh, one of the few countries that is not. So it, uh, it became a little bit difficult from there. Uh, so what we've been doing is we've been compiling, sorting, and analyzing all kinds of legislation governing the Great Lakes region. And our goal has sort of been to create a, an accessible data bank of legislation and documents, hopefully to facilitate future policy, legal, and academic research. So our team of 13 students has compiled uh, just under 400 documents pertaining to uh, the law governing the Great Lakes. And at this point in time, we feel like we felt like our list was pretty comprehensive. But uh, in like further research, we have found that we're discovering new things every day. Uh, so hopefully, going forward, our data bank will be a living, a living document, and we'll be able to continue adding to it uh, going forward. So my initial uh, research area was the laws governing Lake Huron specifically, and uh, it was nearly impossible to find federal legislation or international treaties focused that focused specifically on Lake Huron. I would found myself going back 150 years with United Kingdom treaties and treaties with indigenous tribes. So that, that proved to have pretty limited relevance to what we're working towards now. So that was pretty difficult focusing on Lake Huron and its contiguous rivers and lakes. But I decided to pivot my research towards uh, Michigan State legislation specifically. Um, and primarily in the area of fishing, environmental protection, boundaries, transportation, uh, and that, that general area. Uh, something to my surprise was that the Michigan State legislation was very accessible and very well organized. Uh, through their state legislation site, I was able to uncover all the documents through its various states of legislation from the bill phase to passing it and it included summaries of everything which which I felt was very useful. To my surprise and to the surprise of some of my colleagues, not all states were quite as organized. One of my colleagues who was focusing on the St. Lawrence Seaway said it was very, very difficult to find anything related to New York State or from New York State. It was pretty disorganized and you were dealing with hundred-year-old not encrypted PDFs and it was pretty it was pretty difficult to narrow down her research from there. Uh, another issue that a lot of my colleagues had was they found that the not only was the law itself decentralized but the the way of accessing the information was very 
was very uh, there was quite a f- there's quite a few sources that we turned to. Uh, I primarily went with databases from the very beginning, like Lexis and Westlaw, and from there turned to state and federal legislation websites, as well as NGO and government documents. Uh, another primary area of my research were uh, through action plans, so they were either management plans or action plans. So these are plans created through federal, state, and non-governmental actors all working in a collaborative effort to address environmental issues in the Great Lakes region. So each Great Lake has its own action plan and then there are action plans aimed at addressing the Great Lakes region as a whole. One of the ones that I did specifically was the Detroit River and Lake St. Clair Basin, which was an area that I think most of our research did not cover at all. So it was interesting to uh, it was interesting to see what was happening in a region that we we're all pretty unfamiliar with. So the goal of these of these action plans is to address pollution, clean up. Uh, clean water for drinking and recreation, uh, natural resources, invasive species, algae bloom, and nutrient loading. Uh, it is unclear at this time like how effective these action plans are going to be, but I think it is useful for government and non-governmental actors to work together to hopefully address the environmental issues facing the Great Lakes today and hopefully some positive changes will come out of it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Mm. Uh, I, I'd, also like, I'd also like to introduce uh, Alexander Peters. Alexander is, uh, Peters, he's a 2L, second year law student at Case Law School. Uh, he's from Kentucky, uh, not quite a Great Lakes state, but we'll, we'll accept his research, so Alex. Hi, again, my name's Alexander Peters. I'm from Eastern Kentucky, uh, not Canadian or anything really to do with the Great Lakes region. But um, yeah, when we started out this project, it's, it, I'm, I'm focused on international law and foreign relations, foreign affairs. It's always kind of bugging to see the US, bugging me to see the US come out and not be a party to any of these really great treaties that we have, you know or have reservations in some things like the ICCPR and other, the UN Convention on the State Law of the Sea. Uh, but to that, my research, I, the research that I'm focusing on today really focused on the federal laws and treaties between Canada and the US. Um, when I was going, when I went through all the research, there weren't, there's not a lot, of, I mean, there are quite a few treaties. Obviously, uh, Professor Petras mentioned them at the beginning of the slideshow. Uh, but the majority of them do kind of concern um, national security, border disputes. But there are things that also go with, inter but a lot of the environmental stuff is left kind of to the states. Um, also, a lot of them are kind of a little outdated. They have been enforced since the early 20th century or even earlier. Um, some of the interesting things that I found, that a lot of us found were the compacts that Professor Petrus talked about. And a lot of the issues that can rise from them going forward into any possible treaty negotiations between the U.S. and Canada, just completely ignoring, like possibly having to ignore some states' agreements in order to kind of find something for the better good of the entire country. Um, a lot of the, but the federal, the federal laws and treaties going forward would be pretty interesting to see how that kind of stuff goes. As far as how the journal is going to go forward with this, we're planning on kind of taking all the research that we've done this semester, or this year, and we've already kind of got a database compiled, but we want to make it very user-friendly user to where people who are going about making, you know, wanting to do some more legislation, trying to find, trying to find research on the legislation that we have between the two countries, or agreements between states and provinces in the countries can uh, can find it all in one place that's very accessible, very clean and navigable. 
Um, at, at the time being, it's not in that state. We definitely have a lot of work to do. Uh, we do it, but we're going to definitely keep up with this over the next few years going forward to see how it goes. Um, and long term, we, we do think it would be amazing to see this be used for a possible, like, you know, a treaty or convention governing the Great Lakes, kind of bring it all together and make it much more concise and centralized as opposed to being split, you know, all across the, all across the areas that we have today. Um, but I think, I think that's all I have to talk okay, about. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Al. Yeah, the, the students um, have done an incredible amount of work, and as we mentioned, you know, we, we hope this is going to become something useful uh, for everyone who's interested. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things we found. So um, one question, who owns, the, who owns the Great Lakes? Okay, who owns it, right? Um, it's interesting. <clears throat> Ohio and most states have, have a statute. Ohio um, told itself that it owns Lake Erie, you know, from the boundaries of, of uh, Ohio up to the international border. And it, it just, in, in section 1506.1.10, actually, of the Ohio Revised Code said, it is hereby declared that the waters of Lake Erie, together with soil beneath their content, do now belong and have always belonged to the state. So there you have it. If you have any questions, it's, of course, this is subject to uh, the powers of the United States. So why is this relevant? Well, it's, it's relevant because all of you have heard about this uh, program, Icebreaker Wind Power Incorporated, which wants to build uh, windmills on Lake Erie, right? Actually on uh, Lake Erie in Cuyahoga County, Ohio. And you say, well, how, how can they do that? Who decides what they're going to do or where it's going to go? And actually, they have a lease. It's called a submerged land lease from the state of Ohio, which has leased uh, acreage under Lake Erie it, within Cuyahoga County uh, to, uh, actually, they, they leased it to uh, the, the organization that's called, um, let me tell you, it is, they leased it to Lake Erie Energy Development Corporation, okay? Uh, and Lake Erie Energy Development Corporation assigned that lease with the consent of Ohio to Icebreaker Wind Power Incorporated. And the question is, you know, they're, they're still in the permitting phase. It's actually uh, the Ohio agency that deals with sightings of power plants that is determining uh, the permission to, to put this facility on Lake Erie. Uh, another issue, what about mining? What about mining under Lake Erie? Uh, there is a mine under Lake Erie. It's now owned by Cargill, but when Axel Nobel owned that mine, I actually represented Axel Nobel on several projects, had to go down into this mine several times, and it was very interesting because it's about 2,000 feet under the lake, and uh, you go down a big elevator, and when you get down to the bottom, you know, you don't turn south, all right? You only go north because you only want to be under Lake Erie. And this was intentional because uh, the mining operators only wanted to have a lease, a mineral lease, from one, one landlord, which was the state of Ohio. They didn't want to have to figure out everybody who owns all the different parts of Cuyahoga County above them to, to take out the salt. And it's interesting because um, I tried to find the actual statutory authority uh, of who owns the mineral rights. Um, there's, not a, there's, there's not an actual statement that says the surface owner owns the mineral rights. But there are statutes governing mineral rights which say if you don't exploit them, the surface owner is the owner and can take them back even if you have a lease. So that's why there's one landlord uh, leasing those rights uh, right now to Cargill, used to be Axel Nobel. Um, 
Now, let's talk another, another area I wanted to talk about briefly is water usage, because this is an important issue. And this has to do with the types of laws that govern the Great Lakes. So there have been efforts where, you know, companies have tried to take water out of the Great Lakes and sell them to countries in the Middle East or, or to plans to take water from the Great Lakes and pump it down to Arizona or some, you know, arid climate and try to use it for irrigation purposes. And the states, the country, the, the states particularly in the provinces got very concerned about this and said, wait a minute, that's a bad idea. You know, we have to protect this resource, make sure it's sustainable. So the Boundary Water Treaty, uh, to some extent, did address that, all right? Uh, interestingly enough, it doesn't, it doesn't come out and say uh, either country's not allowed to use the water or to divert water. In fact, it, it says the opposite. It says you can do that. You can do that as long as you don't interfere with the other country's rights or you don't interfere primarily with the ability to navigate. So Canada was worried that, you know, something could happen to Lake Michigan and it would lower everything and it would affect navigation for the Canadians. Uh, that was one of the major reasons why we entered into the Boundary Waters Treaty. Uh, so, so anyway, this in and of itself, it has language that says, you know, if we were to divert the water to the extent that we would cause those kind of problems, Canada could have claims against us. Is that all, though? It's just a matter of claims? What about diversion that, you know, takes the water away? We don't want to pay claims. We want to preserve the resource. Uh, so there is a compact in existence. It's called the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Water Resources Compact and, and Companion Agreement because it's actually two things. So the compact is an agreement between the eight Great Lakes states and it creates the Compact Council. The Compact Council members are the governors of the eight Great Lakes states. All right, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin Sustainable Water Resources Agreement <clears throat> is an agreement between the two Canadian provinces, <clears throat> excuse me, and the eight Great Lakes states. And it is uh, the, the, mem the members of, it creates what's called the regional body. And the regional body is made up of the premiers of the two Canadian provinces, Ontario and Quebec, and the governors of the eight Great Lakes states. Uh, the compact was entered into December 13, 2005, the same day that the agreement was entered into. And then con Congress consented to the agreement and the, the President of the United States signed it on December 8, 2008. Okay, so here's a couple interesting things to note about the way this works, the way this compact works. Um, if a party seeking to divert water from the Great Lakes or, or to increase usage is one of the states, all right, then the Canadian provinces are involved in the review process. But the decision will be made by the, by the, uh, the compact, all right, by the compact council. So the decision itself, although we have to involve the two Canadian provinces, um, the decision will be made by the council, which is only the eight, eight Great Lakes governors. Okay, whereas if the party who wants to do the diversion or increase the usage is a Canadian province, it's the regional body that will make the decision. So in that case, uh, it would include Canada and, the, and, and, and uh, you know, the two Canadian provinces, Ontario and Quebec. But they would also have to have the approval of each of the eight governors of the Great Lakes states. All right, so. Um, another interesting fact is that the federal government uh, of Canada and the United States are not parties. Although, although the U.S. government signed the compact, the signature was saying, okay, states, you can agree with these provinces. 
but the government itself, the U.S. government, is not. Whether that's relevant or not, I'm not sure if the question ever came up, if the United States government said, we are going to take water and send it down to Arizona, you know, what legal arguments would we have to stop that? I think we would have legal arguments, but we wouldn't have the arguments that, hey, you can't do that, you know, compact stops you. Uh, yeah. Right, that would be our, that, John there, John there would do it, right. No, you, it would have to be, you know, I mean, obviously it wouldn't, it, you know, would, it would have to be a judicial order, I guess, or injunction or something, yeah. yeah. Um, it would be an interesting legal issue, you know. So here's a, here's a picture of what is the Great Lakes Basin, which is what this compact and agreement wants to protect, all right? And if you know, there's the city of Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, they are in a county that straddles the basin, you know, where on one side the water goes towards the Mississippi and the other side it goes into the Great Lakes. They had problems with their water system, with their groundwater system because of high levels of radioactive nuclei and they couldn't use it publicly, so they wanted to take water from the Great Lakes. Uh, because they were in a straddle county, that required the permission, uh, that the, the compact and the agreement came into force, and it was exercised, and what happened is uh, all the governors agreed, and uh, Canada provinces weighed in on the review process, and they were allowed to divert. Now, what, what the deal is, is that all the water that they take and use in their public water system then has to be drained back toward the Great Lakes. You know, that's the deal. So hopefully th there won't be anything. Now let's talk a little bit about a navigation treaty. Um, and this, by the way, uh, there was, there is an effort by the Conference of Great Lakes Governors and Premiers to create a treaty, a navigation treaty. And um, the legal the legal department of that conference asked the Canada US Law Institute to get involved in the research background on that, and we did. And there is the result of that is a law review article <clears throat> in our law journal of uh, 2018 that talks about a treaty for binational management of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Maritime Transportation System. So I, I hope that all you interested people will read that article. But there, there's a lot of uh, interesting things. If a ship goes from Montreal to Duluth, Minnesota, it'll cross the international boundary 29 times. Um, Congress has expressed an interest in certain laws um, where it views the Great Lakes as a single maritime system. Canada also, in its laws concerning pilotage, has at least impliedly looked at the Great Lakes as a single maritime system. So the question is, do we need a treaty? And yes, there are a number three. So let's look at like depth of channel and dredging. I already mentioned to you that by agreement between the United States and Canada, we keep the levels, the navigation levels at 27 feet depth. Well, that requires dredging, you know, in all the ports, all the rivers, et cetera, all the locks. So Who's responsible for this dredging? Well, in, in, in the U.S., the entity that actually does it is the Uni U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. But we have, two, we have two organizations. We have the St. Lawrence Seaway, as far as the St. Lawrence Seaway goes, we have the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation. That's a corporation owned by the U.S. Department of Transportation. There's a similar organization in Canada called the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation and that's owned by the Transportation Ministry in Canada. And those organizations uh, have agreed to collaborate with each other and cooperate in the management of the locks. Now, the lock operations, by the way, um, there are several locks that the U.S. manages under the Development Corporation <clears throat> and several that are managed by the Canadians under the Management Corporation. The Sioux locks, 
which are the locks between Superior and Lake Huron, are managed by the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And why is a treaty important? Because we need coordination on all of these issues, icebreaking, customs, pilotage, safety, shipping, uh, and related water quality issues. Let's talk about water quality real quickly about algal blooms, all right? In 2015, Toledo had to shut down its water supply because of toxic algal blooms. Um, just last summer, we had an algal bloom that was 600, 620 square miles, seven times the size of Cleveland. Okay, so who addresses this? Well, US EPA does, Ohio EPA does, City of Toledo, Michigan, Ontario, Indiana, and all these other non-governmental groups, such as the Lake Erie Water Keepers, the Cleveland Water Alliance, and others. Um, Water algal blooms are not new. We used to have them in the 60s and 70s, and we limited the amount of phosphorus going into the Great Lakes, and they went away uh, pretty much, but they came back in the 90s again, and particularly large blooms in 2006 and, and 2003. Um, so that Ohio undertook uh, an effort to deal with this, and they created the Ohio Lake Erie Phosphorus Task Force. And they have, they have met uh, and produced two reports, the first task force and the second. And if you're interested and you're a scientist, you should read these. I was very impressed with the work that they did, very technically oriented, very detailed, talking about farming practices, uh, public wastewater treatment systems, et cetera. And anyway, um, we now have the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We have the U.S. Action Plan for Lake Erie 2017. And then we also have this agreement. It's agreement between Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario. It's not, it's not been approved by the US government, hasn't been signed. But essentially, those three bullet points here are the bullet points. Um, and that's it. That's all the agreements, two-page agreement. You know? So when your client says, give me a two-pager, you know, <laughs> somebody did. <laughs> and, and the goal was to um, reduce the amount of phosphorus going into the Great Lakes uh, by 40% by 2025 and hopefully 20% this year. Not sure, and they agreed on a base year of 2008, and then they agreed to cooperate and, and work together. So that's the egg boom. Invasive species, I, I just want to tell you, you know, invasive species is a big issue. Uh, part of the problem is ballast water coming in from ocean-going vessels and dumping it here. Um, right now, there's, there's uh, the International Maritime Commission has issued ballast water issues that the U.S. and Canada both agree to. Um, but the, the U.S. is a little bit upset with Canada because Canada is trying to limit uh, certain ballast water activities which would discriminate against U.S. ships that would have to be retrofitted. And almost all states now do not allow you to put your boat into a Great Lake if you've got uh, invasive species attached to it, whether they're plants or animals. Okay, well, don't forget to fill out your CLE form, and uh, thanks for attending.